This is a live recording of a presentation given by Rachel Searles for the Altadena branch of the Seed Library of Los Angeles. It was live recorded on a Zoom presentation on Saturday, December 5th, 2020. Branch of the Seed Library of Los Angeles. Uh, before I get started, I need to mark that today's an important day for us. It's our third anniversary as a branch of the Seed Library of Los Angeles. We started on December in 2017. And I need to say thank you to a bunch of uh, people and organizations. Um, we partnered with the Altadena Library, the public library. Um, they have been an avid supporter of us and we've been working in partnership with them since the beginning of the library in Altadena. And I need to thank Melissa Aldana, who's our liaison at the Altadena Library. She's been just great. She helps us with programming and with whatever we need. Um, it's been instrumental in getting us set up there physically. Helped me get the seeds out of the library <laughs> when COVID came and we um, needed to uh, move the operation outside of the, li of the Altadena Library. I also need to thank, um, I don't think he's here, but Elu Navarro. Uh, he was the chair of the Seed Library of Los Angeles when we got started, and without him, we wouldn't be here today. Um, he really was our cheerleader and did everything he could to get us up and running. I also want to just thank um, our volunteers and our membership and the Seed Library of LA um, board, um, who without all the work of all these people together, we wouldn't be here today. So happy thir third year to, to us and hopefully there'll be many, many more. Um, before we jump into Rachel's talk, I'm gonna hand it over to Gina, one of our volunteers, and she's just gonna quickly uh, describe and talk about what the Seed Library is. Thanks, Jessica. I'm Gina. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk about um, what SLOLA is and how it works. So we're a not-for-profit local organization based in LA and we have one branch in Venice. Um, and while we do have lead organizers like Sue, Danielle, Deborah, and myself and our head coordinator, Jessica, we are a collective. So that means that we're growing with the model that depends on the participation of our community, which is you guys. Um, the goals of SLOLA are to grow acclimated seeds to our specific bioregion and climate so that we can cultivate crops and plants that are more resilient hardy and fruitful because they're naturalized to our weather here in East LA. Um, this process is considered to take seven seasons of consecutive growing. Um, another goal that we have is to build community. Um, we want a community of gardeners and people who are interested in food security, habitat restoration and wildlife, as well as a network of knowledge and wisdom so that we can cultivate communal resilience for us humans um, a legacy of the seeds that we're growing and the wildlife we cohabitate with. Our meetings are always open for all to attend and they're free. Um, we have speakers each month who will share on various topics that we find relevant to our mission and also um, we factor in what you guys want to learn about. And to be a member you must live in Los Angeles and um, uh, also within proximity to where we would normally meet. So being Altadena, you know, there's a, there's a breadth around there, but um, you have to be fairly local. Um, to check out seeds, you have to be a member and membership is really simple. You pay a one-time $10 donation to the organization and that allows for you to check out four varieties of seeds each month. And they will be um, seasonally appropriate seeds that we choose. Um, so we ask that you tell your family and friends to join. The more members who are growing and contributing their saved seeds, the more robust our library is. We get our seeds from companies like Baker Creek and other amazing uh, open pollinated organic non-GMO seeds. Um, that's really important to us. So when you return your seeds to us, we will know that they are also open pollinated with true parent genetics and um, if you have any more questions about how to save seeds, definitely reach out to us via email or Instagram and we can give you some uh, important links to help you on this uh, learning curve of saving seeds. Um, and that's it for our announcements. Keep your eye in the chats. We're gonna um, be posting links that Rachel wants to share a uh, petition and then some solo links as well. And I will now pass it over to Rachel. 
Before Rachel gets started, let me introduce her. Of course. <laughs> All right, so um, I first met Rachel when I was admitted to become a master gardener in the training program back in 2017. Um, so that is one of her many hats uh, in the LA uh, community and around agriculture and gardening. Uh, she's the Sustainable Food Systems Advisor for the UC Cooperative Extension and the co-author of the book, which I'm sure she'll be talking about, From Cows to Concrete, The Rise and Fall of Farming in Los Angeles. So with that, I'm just going to hand it over to you, Rachel, to take it away. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, thanks, everybody, for being here this morning. Um, and I see a lot of familiar faces. A lot of master gardeners have joined us this morning and others that I know as well. So this is really cool. Thank you for being here. So this actually, this book kind of comes out of the master gardener program in a way. A um, number of years ago, probably 15 years ago or so, I was a graduate student. I was procrastinating on working on my dissertation and I happened to be flipping through old uh, LA County Agriculture Commissioner reports and found these amazing statistics that I hadn't previously been familiar with that show that Los Angeles County in the 20th century for a good chunk of the 20th century was a huge agricultural producer. And that kind of blew my mind because I work for University of California's Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. I'm not an LA native, but this was news to me. So I kind of tucked it away in the back of my mind that I wanted to write about this topic. and. Um, I, in my mind, I was writing about it. I was more like buying books and collecting ephemera and stuff that might help me write it at some point. And, but I would talk about it. And one day I was talking to Yvonne Savio, who at that time was our master gardener coordinator, telling her all about this book that I wanted to write. And she said, ooh, you might wanna talk to Judy Gerber about that. She's a master gardener and she's writing a book just like that. So, um, that um, turned out to be so fortuitous because Judy and I met and we thought, gosh, how could we have such similar ideas? Let's put these things down on paper. So we each wrote out the outline we had in mind for the book. We traded, we went, you know, holy cow, this has to be kismet because we have the exact same idea for a book. So Judy and I worked together for seven years and this book was put out by Angel City Press in 2016. So, you know, we do a, quite a few uh, talks at libraries and historical societies and so forth. So I'm really excited to talk to you today because you're a seed library. Altadena itself has amazing agricultural history. So we're going to go on a bit of a whirlwind tour of the agricultural history of LA County, or as Judy and I like to call it, uh, from cows to concrete. So this is the Los Angeles that we know today. It's a very urban place. It's a dense city, sprawling city. And our population is now over, well over 10 million people. I think this is a number from a few years ago. So when people think about Los Angeles, they don't usually think about agriculture or farming yet it's there, it's out on the fringes oftentimes of the county. Uh, for example, this is an organic peach orchard out in the Antelope Valley uh, in Los Angeles County, albeit 60 miles from downtown. So often agriculture is where you least expect it. And I think the reason that Judy and I got through seven years working on this book. We thought we'd get it done in like six months or something. We were so naive. <laughs> we had no idea what we were getting into. Um, the, but the reason we got through writing a book that was this, um, that covered basically several centuries of history is we both got fascinated by this idea of what happened. How did this landscape and this place we know as Los Angeles, how did it how was it transformed so radically in a matter of decades? How did we go from this? This woman is uh, circa 1905, sitting on a hill overlooking Hollywood, which at that time was mostly lemon groves. How do we go to this, from that to this in such really a short period of time? 
So we were obsessed, I have to say, and we just kept digging and digging to try to do the best we could to tell the story. And at some point early in our research, we ran across this photo. It was in the Los Angeles Public Library archives. And these um, cattle are escaped from a transport truck on the Golden State Freeway. And we can't tell if it's their handlers or the paparazzi that are trying to chase them down. But um, this photo sort of resonated with us like this was once an agricultural place. And now the only contact a lot of people have with agriculture is when they see transport trucks full of cattle or hogs or big stacks of uh, hay bales going by on the freeway. And so this gave us the spark of the idea for the title of the book, From Cows to Concrete. We, because we were naive non-historians, we said, let's go all the way back to pre-colonial times in Los Angeles and take it up to the present. So we really did a lot of reading on what, um, what was the food system of Los Angeles like before it was colonized? And we really learned a lot about that, about the indigenous people of the Los Angeles basin. The fact that this was an abundant place. Um, they weren't farmers in the way that we think of farmers today, but they did cultivate a wild harvest. They protected the oak trees and harvested acorns, which were an important food supply. They harvested seeds from numerous uh, wild plants that had edible seeds and different kinds of edible fruit and bulbs. There was also abundant game and seafood, and there was much more water at that time. So this was a place of abundant food. And these are the first historically recorded words of what this area looked like as a group of uh, Spanish colonists who were sort of the first advanced team of colonization went through the Los Angeles area. Uh, they were on their way from San Diego to try to find Monterey where they were going to build a fort. And so this spot that they're describing would be um, probably where the cornfield, AKA the State Historic Park is in Chinatown in downtown LA today, where the river um, goes right next to Chinatown. So this is what they noticed about the place we now call Los Angeles. It was um, a place of um, abundant grapes and rose bushes and it had loamy soil. And so they looked at this place and they said, aha, this would be a place to uh, start a settlement. So it was no surprise that just a few years later, uh, the Spanish colonists came back and started the mission San Gabriel. This is a painting that hangs today in the Laguna Art Museum and captures a moment in time where the indigenous people of Los Angeles um, are interacting with the mission personnel and it's a whole nother lecture and a whole nother topic, the devastation of the Native American communities of Los Angeles and all of California uh, at the hands of the colonial government and later the American government. Um, but this is, um, this just shows a moment in time of their interaction. In this place, the Mission San Gabriel really became, um, as it's often called, the mother of California agriculture because here were the, pla were the places where um, the Spanish colonists tried different crops that they brought from elsewhere to see how they would do in this new remote colony. So here they tried out things like wheat and barley, cattle, um, citrus, wine grapes, things that would later become the seeds of massive California agricultural empires. They started here at the mission San Gabriel. Um, and the first farm labor force were the Native Americans who were of course devastated by, uh, by diseases and other things that the colonists brought. As, um, as Los Angeles over the years spread out from around the mission, what you would have seen was a lot of this. Cattle ranching was really the first economy of Los Angeles because Los Angeles was a remote place where people did not necessarily 
want to come or at least come and stay. So the colonial Spanish government, then later the, the Mexican government would give huge tracts of land to retired soldiers and others to get them to stay here. And so someone might, might own miles and miles and miles of property uh, where they graze cattle. And the, there was really not a cash economy. They traded cattle hides uh, for furniture, for whiskey, for clothing, for whatever they needed. Soon, another kind of enterprise grew up that was very much centered in downtown Los Angeles. And you, you can still see street names named after some of the early French vintners that came to Los Angeles, uh, like Jean-Louis Vignes, and brought um, their French winemaking technology. So it turned out Los Angeles was a wonderful place to grow grapes and to make wine. The first wine wasn't very good. Someone who visited in the 1850s called it fit only for a sailor to drink. Um, but later um, with the French winemaking technologies, it actually became world famous for its wine. And although today we think of Napa and Sonoma sort of as California's wine country, this was California's first wine country. Some of those early wine grape growers also began to experiment with citrus. At first, the citrus was just at the mission and the mission padres didn't really want others growing it, but people would get a few plants here and there to experiment with. And um, over the years, they began having excellent success with citrus, but there wasn't really a big market for agricultural products at this point, like in the 1840s, there were so few people here there wasn't a lot of um, market for different crops that farmers grew, but the gold, gold rush really transformed everything for Los Angeles because although the rush of population was to Northern California to the gold fields, all those 49ers needed fresh produce. Um, they were trying to avoid scurvy. And although people didn't understand the science of vitamin deficiency then, they did know that if you ate things like citrus and lemon and other fresh fruits and vegetables, your teeth wouldn't fall out, you wouldn't get sick and you wouldn't die. So oranges and lemons from the groves in Los Angeles were suddenly in hot demand as was cattle. So the cattle ranchers would, would drive their cattle up the coast to San Francisco and sell it on the hoof for a fortune up there. And Los Angeles began to become a much wealthier place transformed by this gold rush money. The 49ers, of course, also wanted wine and brandy uh, from Los Angeles. So LA's fortunes began to turn around from a tiny remote place into something different until this horrific drought in the 1860s. Um, and this quote was from a rancher in Orange County, which by the way, was part of Los Angeles County at that time, but it was an absolutely devastating drought. The cattle died off by the thousands or were picked off by predators, which were common here at that time, like grizzly bears. And the cattle economy, which was really the foundation of the early Southern California economy just completely crashed. And a lot of people really thought nothing would ever come of Los Angeles and not just Los Angeles, but all of Southern California, that it was a place that was always gonna be dusty and remote with no real economic development. Um, but a lot of people came in at that time to buy up all those rancho lands. The ranchos fell apart. Um, rancheros could, who own those giant tracts of cattle land could no longer afford to keep it all. And so it got sold off to developers, many of them from Northern California with gold rush money. And what, did they, what could they do with that, that land on the short term? They could grow wheat. So wheat became the most important crop for many years um, because it didn't require irrigation. You could plant it in the fall and a few months later, you would have this golden harvest, which you could ship off to Liverpool, England, which was the grain market of the time. So this was a wheat uh, harvest in Van Nuys. And also um, people began to come here for their health. Um, at that time, they called it consumption. 
because it was a terrible disease which consumed your body as you coughed. Um, today we call it tuberculosis. It was a huge crisis and people would die when they got it, but they were told, well, if you could get somewhere warm and work outside in the sun and the warm air, you might get well. So lots of people began to come to Los Angeles for, um, to rehabilitate or attempt to rehabilitate from a consumption or tuberculosis. And many of them took up small farming enterprises such as beekeeping. So uh, in this era, the 1880s, if you looked up above Altadena in the foothills around Altadena, Pasadena, you would have seen all these little, they called them bee ranches. So beekeeping became a very important enterprise for these um, invalids who were trying to convalesce here in the Southern California sunshine. And farmers also tried so many different things, just trying to get some traction, some kind of enterprise that would keep them going. For example, at one point, uh, Los Angeles was gonna be the silk production capital that was going to um, rival China and France. And uh, the state actually funded um, bounties for planting, uh, not eucalyptus trees, mulberry trees so that the leaves could be used for silk production. And there was silk uh, manufacturing that was happening in the Los Angeles area. This is a young man gathering mulberry leaves. Farmers tried pineapples even, and you can grow pineapples in Los Angeles, they're just not very sweet. But here is a pineapple plantation over on what's now Gower Street in Hollywood. But again, there wasn't a whole lot of market for what farmers could grow, especially after the gold rush ebbed. So what the real game changer was, was the railroad. When the railroad came, suddenly farmers could get what they grew to distant markets. So you could grow lettuce and all kinds of crops and vegetables and fruit here in Los Angeles, and then ship it to cold places like Chicago and New York during the winter time um, and you could get a premium for it. So it really, really changed the game for farmers. And this is where the real um, beginnings of, I think what is sort of at the crux of Los Angeles's economy comes in, which is land and real estate. So in, 18, in the 1880s, you see this first land boom. And here's how land worked in these first years and for many years in Los Angeles is you sold the land along with a dream of becoming a small scale farmer. So people came here because there were so many share, stories shared in the national media and in books of, of the abundant farmland here about how you could grow, grow giant fruits and vegetables almost with no effort of all at all, which of course was untrue, but people bought into this fantasy. The LA Chamber of Commerce and the LA Times pushed this and subdividers created these communities where you could buy a house with maybe two to five acres of land around it and people bought these up like hotcakes. So all of Los Angeles began to be divided into these small farm home communities. And this is one that would have been near downtown LA. And as a real estate obsessed Angelino myself, I just love this $10 down, $10 per month, no interest, if only 150 to 450 per lot. <laughs> so the Chamber of Commerce was very involved in that, what we call the small farm home movement. And it also heavily organized and pushed Los Angeles agriculture uh, they had this showcase downtown where people could come to see all these agricultural displays. This is their headquarters where they had this giant elephant made out of Los Angeles grown walnuts. Walnut production was huge here. A uh, giant tree made out of wine bottles. And they would send agricultural produce from Los Angeles by train throughout the country, along with mountains and mountains of pamphlets on why you should move to Los Angeles and enjoy the California sunshine and become a small scale farmer. This guy was sort of the mastermind. His name is Frank Wiggins. He ran the LA Chamber of Commerce and he pushed this small farm home mythology and uh, the agricultural bounty of Los Angeles so hard that water czar William Mulholland 
once said the growth of Los Angeles would never slow until uh, this guy died and um, I, no one was quite sure whether he was joking or not, but this man was extremely influential in sort of the, the catapulting of Los Angeles from a small uh, village or small, very small town into a major city. And also the chamber helped to birth these marketing cooperatives and the most famous one of those is Citrus uh, Sunkist, uh, where the Chamber of Commerce organized citrus growers and said, hey, you guys need to work together so you can have a more uniform crop and get a better price for it and work together to market your crop, uh, which they did to great success and other industries um, modeled their marketing on Sunkist. Um, and, and these uh, marketing cooperatives would do all kinds of things to push these crops that grew here, like oranges and avocados, um, higher into the American consciousness, onto America's plates. Like no one really drank orange juice before. That was purely a creation of Sunkist and this marketing of the idea that for vigorous health, you needed to eat oranges and drink orange juice before you, if you were a kid, you would be lucky to get like one orange in your Christmas stocking or something like that. Also pushing things like avocados, which were new to a lot of American consumers and coming up with slogans such as the aristocrat of salad fruit. So I want to definitely mention avocados because there is a direct link to Altadena. Um, People weren't that familiar with avocados. There weren't a lot of avocado trees in Los Angeles until a nurseryman named Frederick Popano and his sons who owned a nursery in Altadena, um, they were sort of like plant explorers. They would go down to Mexico and bring up plants that they thought might work here in Southern California. And they found some avocados from, um, I think the Puebla region of Mexico, and one particular avocado su survived this terrible freeze in Altadena. So they said, hey, this one is going to be a winner. And since it's strong, let's call it the Fuerte. So the first um, wave of the California avocado industry was built on the Fuerte avocado, which was first cultivated uh, right in Altadena after it was brought from Mexico. So while the avocado industry in LA was never as huge as the citrus industry, for example, it was significant. Um, other things that push the citrus industry um, include new varieties. So we always like to mention this lady, Eliza Tibbetts. She was so fascinating. Um, she was an early feminist and she was a medium, she, people hired her to communicate with the dead. And um, she and her husband, Luther, had zero farming experience, but they decided to come from um, Washington, DC to go live in Riverside. And she had a friend who worked at the brand new US Department of Agriculture in Washington, DC. And Eliza wrote him and said, we're living here in Riverside, California. What can we grow? Uh, we want to be farmers. And he had these two Brazilian orange seedlings that had been uh, brought from Brazil and apparently had a very sweet flavor and an easy to peel skin. And he sent them to her by train. And so she and her husband uh, went down to Los Angeles and they picked up these two little trees and they took them back to Riverside in their buckboard wagon. She planted them in her yard and watered them with her dishwater. And these became the first two naval orange trees, Washington naval orange trees, they were called because they came from Washington, DC. Um, and this sparked huge growth in the orange uh, cultivation, the growth of the citrus industry, because now there was an orange fruit that was sweeter and more easy to peel. So this new variety really pushed uh, the citrus industry. Another thing that made Los Angeles agriculture so successful and saw this continual growth was that there were so many groups of immigrant farm workers who came here uh, and ultimately became part of the fabric, uh, made Los Angeles what it is today. Um, and these are uh, some of the Chinese farm workers in these uh, folks are in Eagle Rock at a strawberry farm. 
but um, after the the Continental Rail, Transcontinental Railroad was completed. Chinese workers had been brought here to work on that. And after the last spike was driven, many of them came to Southern California and became farm workers or farmers. Um, later uh, came Japanese immigrants who became farmers, uh, Mexican immigrants who became farmers. So uh, our agriculture was spurred by um, immigrant farmers and farm workers. And by 1909, look at these statistics. Can you imagine, like think of Los Angeles today and how few and far between farms are. There were 8,000 farms. We were the number one agriculture county in the United States, not just California, the entire United States. We were the top producer in so many different things and dairies and poultry ranches proliferated all over the county. Believe it or not, we were also a center for commercial seed production. And I, if you ever see a copy of this book, I highly recommend it. It's called Southern California Gardens, an Illustrated History by Victoria Padilla. Amazing book. She goes into great detail about the different uh, seed companies that had production here and in fact started here like Germain Seed Company, which uh, was around here in Los Angeles for years. Um, a Swiss guy who came I think in the 1860s or 1870s and started this uh, seed company and plant nursery. Um, and this sort of tied in with the whole rise of the nursery industry because as Los Angeles spread out and suburbanized and we have this beautiful 12 month growing season, Angelinos were passionate gardeners and, and there was always a demand for not only seeds, but also plants, bulbs, et cetera. So out of Germain seeds, for example, came Theodore Payne who first started working with Germains, then started his own nursery specializing in California natives. And this is Theodore Payne's um, nursery, I think it was on Broadway in downtown LA at that time. Part of that interest in plants was driven by um, what we call in the book, fantastic farms, sort of these hybrid farms where they also feature many, many colorful plants and landscapes. And this was just one of these sort of more quirky um, tourist attractions, an ostrich farm. These were very popular in the early 20th century. I believe this is the one in South Pasadena. And the kids are being warned that um, ostriches like to kick and it looks like they've put something over the ostrich's head to keep it from kicking. Another uh, driver of the unbelievable growth of agriculture in the first half of the 20th century was of course water. Um, the city of Los Angeles uh, pulled all kinds of shenanigans to bring water via the Los Angeles aqueduct duct from um, up near Mono Lake, the Owens Valley, all the way down to Los Angeles. And usually um, there's another photo that's featured where William Mulholland is, is uh, with the crowd that's watching the, the water come down the chute the very first day um, that the aqueduct opens. And um, we chose a different photo. And this is where the aqueduct, I think in 1923, has been bombed um, because those Owens Var uh, Valley farmers were so angry, they lost their capacity to farm as we got the water down here. And because of that um, new water delivery, the San Fernando Valley greened up and spread out and even more of these small farm home communities grew up and even something called the Little Lander Movement where people wanted to have one acre in independence and um, that was possible to some extent in the San Fernando Valley. But really, even though Los Angeles was selling and promoting these small farm home communities, the reality of agriculture in the 1920s, 30s was more like this. It was more large scale commercial agriculture. This is a celery field in Venice in the 1920s. And it wasn't just the farms, but it was all the 
uh, subsidiary businesses. For example, here are women sorting walnuts um, from the many, many walnut groves in the Los Angeles area. And these kinds of packing jobs and sorting jobs affiliated with farming were some of the first uh, job opportunities for women out of their homes. By the 1930s, the small farm homes became really more about subsistence as the economy crashed and people struggled, just like today during COVID where people have turned to gardening and growing their own food, so too did that happen during the depression. And um, this is a photo taken by famed uh, uh, depression era photographer, Dorothea Lang. She took that amazing migrant mother photo that I'm sure everybody has seen. But here she's um, photographing a family on their small farm home uh, plot in El Monte. And if you drive through neighborhoods in El Monte, you can still see these homes with their oversized lots. In the 1930s, there was also a lot of farm labor fights. Uh, today, we often associate uh, farm labor uh, struggles with the you know, 1960s, 1970s, United Farm Worker Movement with Cesar Chavez. But really that started long before. And in the 1930s, there were many strikes based, based in Los Angeles. In particular, there was one called the El Monte Berry Strike that started with raspberry pickers in El Monte and spread to fruits and vegetable fields throughout the county. Um, these are some uh, workers in a raspberry field in Rosemead during that era. But um, as it, although the, the whole era of the depression was brutal on both farmers and farm workers, um, still at the end of the decade, you can see that agriculture here was very strong. I mean, look at this amazing statistic, nearly half of the Los Angeles food supply originates on farms within 50 miles of the city. Now I can tell you this kind of stati statistic is not collected today because the amount would be so infinitesimal, it would be very hard to measure. It would be like less than a percent of a percent. It would be a tiny amount of food. So it's very impressive that even in 1940, there was still this much agriculture in Los Angeles, which was rapidly suburbanizing. And much of it was due to uh, immigrant farmers. And um, for example, Japanese and Japanese American farmers, um, they did truck farming where they farmed on plots of land that were yet undeveloped and harvested and took their harvest to market, such as this lady who is in Gardena. But of course, this um, tragically fell apart um, during World War II when Japanese and Japanese Americans were incarcerated in places like Manzanar or in this man's case in Jerome Relocation Center in, in Arkansas because people lost their land. California had law, laws that uh, made it impossible for Japanese and Japanese Americans to own land. So they had to lease it and there were strict limits on how long they could lease it for. So they might have invested decades in a certain plot of land as, as they uh, held on to it through various lease arrangements, but they lost it when they were incarcerated. They often lost all their equipment, all their seeds, all their um, investments that had gone into this land. And many of those small family farmers were never able to get back into farming. So this is really where you start to see LA's uh, network of small and large farms begin to fall apart. And um, because of people going off to war during World War II and the incarceration of so many farmers, um, who were Japanese and Japanese American, soon there weren't enough farm workers and the US government uh, started the whole Bracero program, which began to bring people from rural Mexico to work in farms and orchards, not only in Los Angeles, but throughout the nation. But there were many Braceros who worked on Los Angeles citrus orchards and ranches. And this is the first train of Braceros coming to Los Angeles in the 1940s. 
a flip side of the 1940s as farmers grappled with labor challenges was the whole national obsession over victory gardens, which again have sort of come back into the national discussion. Uh, LA Unified School District was getting kids, were, they were getting kids out there to teach people how to garden and help plant gardens. This is Manual Arts High School. Um, where they did tons of gardening. They not only garden as they did at every other school and university and in cities throughout the county, they also taught kids in school how to produce food like raising rabbits. And um, there was still a lot of agricultural land here in LA County as World War II ended. This is um, looking over Covina in 1945. Look at all those citrus groves. You can see that um, development is beginning to start, but it's still acres upon acres of orange groves and lemon groves. But as people came back from the war and as more and more people came to Los Angeles to get jobs in the defense industry and other kinds of industries that were booming, um, agriculture was on the wane. First, uh, you could see farming on the peripheries of neighborhoods and slowly as people wanted more subdivisions, they didn't want tractors, they didn't want animals, they didn't want stinky dairies down the street from them. Soon subdivisions began to look more like this. And by the 1960s, most agriculture was zoned out of a lot of cities in Los Angeles County and now we're trying to change zoning in a lot of cases so that people can have things again like backyard bees and backyard chickens and so forth because people didn't like agriculture so much in the 1950s, 1960s, but now a lot of people like it again. Angelinos never quite gave up on their love of gardens and farms. In the 1970s and 1980s, for example, the Tom Bradley administration in the city of LA promoted community gardens. Here's Mayor Bradley, along with TV star of Green Acres, Eddie Albert, um, breaking ground at a community garden in Reseda. And here's a community garden right on Bunker Hill in downtown LA. And Angelino's also became over the years passionate consumers of agricultural products and through things like farmers markets, although they were no longer farmers, they still influenced and shaped California agriculture in many ways. For example, driving um, movements to reduce pesticides and produce more organic crops. Um, some of you who are my age or older will remember a time when the medfly was a huge concern here in Los Angeles and helicopters would fly over every night and spray malathion like right over all our communities and you would go out in the morning and there'd be like sticky stuff on your car and communities rose up against this. They said, no, we're not gonna have our communities sprayed even though we understand um, the medfly is important and all this kind of organizing really pushed California agriculture uh, in a direction of providing more organic produce, um, thinking more about sustainability. And although there are still many conflicts between agriculture and its needs and the needs in communities. Even in the 1980s, there was still plenty of farmland. Here's a farmland at farm in 1983 that was about to get plowed under to make the 105 freeway, the Century Freeway. But slowly over the years, um, a lot of the land disappeared. Now that's not to say we don't have farming in Los Angeles County, that's far from it. Um, if you go up in the Antelope Valley, you can still find giant fields of carrots, you know, those ba baby carrots that you buy are oftentimes they're grown up in the Lancaster Palmdale area by giant companies like Grimway. You can also find big fields of onions, pick your own peaches and cherries, uh, fields of alfalfa and other agriculture out in the Antelope Valley. But what we see more of in the city parts of LA um, and has have become more high profile in recent years are um, what we call urban farming or urban agriculture. Here's one example at the growing experience in Long Beach. 
It's in a public housing community. Here's another example on the right. Um, this is the Expo Urban Mini Farm next to USC. And this is a community resource which helps to feed people in a community that really needs extra food. And these kinds of urban agriculture projects are always up against a lot of challenges. For example, one of the reasons agriculture went away, well, I would say the main reason is because the value of the land went up so much. So even when you get a plot of land for urban agriculture, there's constant pressure to develop it. And this particular farm, the Expo Urban Mini Farm, is actually somewhat under threat right now. Um, and I'm gonna ask Danielle to drop a, a petition in the, um, in the chat because the city over the years has tried different ways to maybe make this a parking lot instead um, or other things that it's clear that the city might have some other ideas how this land should be used, but we're in the middle of a pandemic when people really need food. And my feeling is now is not the time to take land away from a community enterprise. There's so many wonderful nonprofit groups that do urban farming. And I saw someone was on this morning from Alma Backyard Farms, that's in Compton, an amazing organization that um, trains formerly incarcerated people to become farmers. And they've been hard at work provisioning their neighborhood, um, pulling together fresh produce and other food for people who are really, really in great need due to the pandemic. Um, we, all, we still can find little signs of LA's agricultural past, even today, even in Los Angeles, the urban place that we know. For example, um, Compton has, has this amazing agricultural neighborhood called Richland Farms. And here's this guy, Derek, uh, with his horse in Richland Farms. Tons of people have horses and um, big backyards. It's one of the original small farm home communities. It's just never been developed to the extent that other others have been developed. So you can't see many others anymore, but you can still see that original concept uh, in real life in Richland Farms. And until a couple of years ago, there was also this amazing tree that was sort of this historic sentinel in Compton. Um, this was called the Eagle Tree and it was planted and grew up during the uh, rancho times. It was one of the boundary markers of one of the three original giant ranches uh, during those times, the Rancho San Pedro. And this, um, this tree marked the edge of that ranch, which went all the way to, from Compton to the ocean and north to the LA River. And um, it was here for years and years and years. Um, as a reminder of our agricultural history, as a reminder of how what was once prime farmland is oftentimes now food deserts in LA County. Um, and unfortunately that terrible drought we had with all the watering restrictions in 2015, 2016 were the end of this tree that had lasted so long, the Eagle Tree. This is uh, the cover of our book, From Cows to Concrete. Um, and Danielle, if you could drop the link in the chat, if any of you are interested in purchasing the book, um, it's, it was printed by Angel City Press and Judy and I labored over it for many years. So we're very proud of it. And um, with that, I would love to answer questions as much as time will allow for. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, if everybody has questions, feel free to drop them into the chat. We can go ahead and um, ask any questions and then Sue, if you wanna check and see if there's been any questions during the chat so far that we can um, answer. I have been keeping an eye out and uh, there have been many wonderful comments, but um, okay, here's a question from Lydia. What evidence do you have that LA-based farmers were using healthy soil practices like compost, mulch, cover crops, no-till, and plants that attract pollinators? Hmm. Well, um, that's an excellent question. I would say that before um, maybe 1920 or so, 
those were just the practices that farmers had to use because there wasn't a lot available. So for example, most farms were multi-use farms where they would have um, animals and then the animal manure would be used on the farm fields and cycled back to the earth that way. Um, you know, traditional practices might have included hedgerows to plant pollinators. These were the cover crops. These were practices that were available to people. I would say that as you got more into the 20s, 30s, 40s, people became more reliant on pesticides, such as some of the early pesticides, which were lead-based and arsenic-based, um, on nitrogen fertilizers. Um, and because land, the cost of land began to increase and increase and increase, farmers had to be super space efficient. So for example, um, dairy farmers stopped um, have producing their forage crops for their animals on site or hay for their animals on site, um, they would bring everything in and just feed the animals in the corral. So it allowed dairy farmers to intensify their production of milk on less land, but it, it no longer allowed for that uh, regeneration of the soil, which had been sort of the more traditional practice. So um, I would say that more of those practices have come back um, over the past 20, 30 years as people have become more interested in sustainability and eating organic produce and so forth. If there are any other questions, please put them into the chat. There's a couple here, let's see. Um, are there any urban ag organizations in the Pasadena Altadena area that folks in Altadena, oh, I just lost it, can get involved in? Well, um, I think the Seed Library of Altadena is a great example of that. Um, the uh, Pasadena Unified School District has a lot of school gardens and um, we have a master gardener, Jill, who's very involved with uh, the various school gardens at, um, at PUSD schools. There's also um, something called the Huntington Ranch at the Huntington, um, where you can see a lot of great gardening practices and different crops demonstrated. Um, but I'm probably blanking on on something. I think there's one um, urban farm that's sort of like a private urban farm, but you can take tours called McDonald's Urban Farm in Altadena. Um, I think there's a few others as well. I see um, somebody mentioning Little Farm Fresh in San Gabriel. That's a beautiful urban farm that's just in um, a couple's front and backyard in San Gabriel, and they have a nice um, system where you can get something called a community supported agriculture or CSA. It's like a basket of fresh produce every week. I think uh, she even delivers. So yeah, there's a lot of people who are trying sort of alternative career paths with urban agriculture. It's not lucrative, but you know, I think it's meaningful to a lot of people. Okay, if you guys look at the um, the comments, you can see other people are making suggestions of places to check out too. Um, you've also got in Pasadena, you've got the uh, DeVray family farm down off of Orange Grove near Lincoln. Right. Um, the urban homestead is that the one? That's you're that's the one. Yeah. The urban homestead. Yes, that's a, a family in Pasadena, and, and they've done this for a number of years now, where they just took their regular sized um, Pasadena uh, residential lot and converted it to an urban farm where they, I believe, they sell to restaurants and they um, they offer tours and workshops. Well except for COVID right now, they probably don't. But yeah, it's one of the longer term uh, urban farms in the Pasadena area. Um, I, I saw someone was asking whether the photos I showed were in our book. Yeah, I would say about 90% of the photos I showed 
are in the book. And the, the book is like a hard copy book. It's sort of like a coffee table book. So um, for the history and Angelino history lover in your life, or even somebody who's just really into gardening and farmers markets and stuff like that, I, they might enjoy it. Oh, I'm seeing that a lot of people filled out the pet petition. Thank you. Yeah, I really hope that uh, that Community Services Unlimited will be able to maintain the Expo Urban Mini Farm. And what about things like the community gardens, like the Altadena Community Garden or the one down by Huntington Hospital? How do those fit in this big picture? Yeah, um, well, I guess um, I think of those more as gardens because they're people in community gardens are growing for their own use or their family usually. But if, you know, sometimes they do dabble in selling produce. So that's when I start calling it urban agriculture is when you're selling something or it's being used in a restaurant or something like that. But yeah, certainly we have a very vibrant community garden movement in Los Angeles. We have a group called the Los Angeles Community Garden Council that coordinates a large network of community gardens. And the number of community gardens in Los Angeles has, uh, has really grown over the past couple of decades because um, people who live in apartments or who don't have yards or who are renters are looking for a place to grow and a community garden can be the answer. Now they have long waiting lists in a lot of cases like um, the president of the Altadena Garden has told me in the past that I think they have a five-year waiting list. So we definitely need more community gardens. Well, thank you so much, Rachel, for joining us today and um, sharing with us your uh, expertise in this area. I learned so much. I have your book and I learned, I just learned, it was just great getting an overview and, and a peek into it before I dive in. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. If there's any, I don't see any last minute questions. Um, everybody's saying thank you. What a wonderful talk. How interesting. Um, yeah. So thank you so much. I, it was my pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, and with that, we'll close our meeting. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, let me re thank you for, I'm just going to unspotlight Rachel. <laughs> Um, can somebody spotlight me because I can't seem to do it for myself. Um, so with that, we'll just, uh, oh, let me, um, here we go. Here we go. There we go. I turned my camera on. <laughs> Thank you for coming and uh, we will see you at a future uh, Seed Library of Altadena meeting. We typically meet the first Saturday of every month um, with a few exceptions here and there. Um, if you're having trouble clicking our links, which some people have um, uh, told me, I, will, I can send out a follow-up email um, with links to our membership forms um, and our email address and all of that as well, um, in case you want to be in touch with the Seed Library. Um, and with that, I think we will, uh, oh, we have a new link in the chat, looks like it's live for a new member form in case you wanna click on that and sign up. Uh, we do our seed checkouts once a month. We, uh, we just did November, so, uh, and they got mailed, so there'll be one in December. And okay, with that, I will end our meeting. Have a lovely weekend and we'll see you again soon.